Good evening, folks. Welcome to week 74 of the Gospel of Luke. If my notes are correct, I have two more classes after this one, and we'll be finished. And then Peter will take on a series that lasts who knows how long, and that's how we do things on Monday nights. Go as long as you can, or as long as you want, or as long as people will tolerate you. <laughs> And I'm kind of surprised that people have stuck with me for 74 weeks, except the people in my family in this house, because they don't have any choice. They're going to hear me no matter where they sit. But I'd like to begin this evening by reading Psalm 16. Psalm 16, which has some bearing on what we're going to be studying this evening. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or to take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. A prophecy in that psalm that the Messiah would not see decay. And he doesn't because last week we looked at the crucifixion of Jesus and saw Jesus die. And... This week, we're going to follow that with the witness to the burial of Jesus, which is an important thing, and then the witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And those first, those first uh, individuals who go out and proclaim that Christ is risen, that Jesus is the Lord is risen, and the response that they meet uh, is not perhaps the response that we would expect the, them to um, encounter. So we're looking this evening at Luke's presentation of the burial and resurrection of Jesus. And each gospel writer has their own way of presenting things and because they're writing to different audiences for different purposes. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. So he's going to focus a lot on the Jewish elements of the burial and the resurrection. So there's several things in Matthew's gospel that are not included here in, in Luke's. And Mark is writing to the Romans and John is writing basically a, a, a theological discourse or a theological uh, dissertation on Jesus as the son of God. And so he's going to present the resurrection from that perspective, from that point of view. Luke is writing to Theophilus a possibly Roman official, a possibly Greek official, uh, an individual who has at least been given the teachings of the gospel, who has heard of these things. Luke is writing to him that he might have certainty concerning the things that he was taught, whether he was taught by Paul as Paul was in prison or he heard it from uh, some other Christian witness. Luke is familiar with this individual. Luke would followed Paul all over the place during Paul's uh, missionary journeys, would be familiar with the individuals that Paul spoke with and who Paul taught. And so it's probably, it's very likely in my, my opinion that Theophilus has been taught by Paul. Paul, perhaps since having been martyred, now Luke is writing to Theophilus because Theophilus has some questions and wants to know what is this all about. And so Luke presents to him the gospel of Luke as, as we have it here. So I want to read for you verse uh, chapter 23, beginning in verse 50, down through uh, verse 12 of chapter 24. And we will go back and make a, uh, a few comments on them. Uh, 
20 or so slides worth of comments on them. Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 50. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. An interesting uh, presentation. Several, each, as I mentioned, each of the gospel writers has their own um, agenda, if you will, in presenting the story of Jesus. And so there are things unique in each account of the burial and the resurrection. Here in the uh, the burial accounts, only Matthew mentions that the Jews put a guard on the tomb because they were familiar with the teaching of Jesus that he was going to rise again on the third day, and they wanted to guard against the possibility that anybody could come in and mess with the tomb. And if Jesus tries to rise, there's going to be a guard there keeping him inside where he belongs and making sure he stays dead. That's not going to happen, and Matthew gives us the details of that. Mark mentions the details of Joseph of Arimathea's uh, request in Mark chapter 15, where he Luke follows his account fairly closely, but uh, what verse is it? 44 to, and following. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the councils, verse 43, was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should already have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. So only Mark gives us that little bit of detail there concerning the burial of, of Christ. And John is the only one who mentions the presence of Nicodemus, who is there helping uh, Joseph of Arimathea wrap the body and, and prepare it for burial and get it in the tomb in time for them to be out of the tomb, have the tomb, the stone rolled shut and have it all sealed up before Sabbath begins so that they can... Uh, they can go and observe Sabbath, which is another detail that only Mark mentions in verse 56, that uh, speaking of the women, the women who have followed Jesus since Galilee, who have followed him all throughout his ministry, that they observed the uh, Sabbath. They rested in accordance with the Torah commandment. Very simple outline, only two sections that we're looking at, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and uh, we will look in some detail at both of these over the next 45-ish uh, minutes as we uh, dig down a little bit into this, because it's a, it's interesting. We don't talk a lot about the burial of Jesus, and I think that's 
kind of a shame because it's an important part of what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, that these things are of first importance that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised again in accordance with the scriptures. He's buried also in accordance with the scriptures, and we'll look at that uh, a little bit later as we get uh, as we get a little further into this. So we're introduced in Luke to Joseph of Arimathea. Told that he was from a Jewish town of Arimathea, which is probably a variant, uh, a, a language variant of the town of Rama, which was a town 20-ish miles northwest from where Jerusalem is. We're told that he is a good and righteous man, a detail that only Luke includes in, in his account. And it recalls the descriptions of Zechariah and Elizabeth in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Uh, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Uh, Simeon is called a a righteous man who has been waiting for the, who's been looking for the redemption, the longing for the one who is going to be the savior of Israel. And he get, has that longing met uh, when he holds the Christ child in his hands in Luke chapter two. We're told that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. And uh, I read for you already Mark 15, verse 43, which also echoes that statement. Also descriptions of Simeon and the prophetess Anna, when Jesus is presented in the tomb when he's eight days old, and, and they, both, uh, they both prophesy about the, about the child that uh, Mary and Joseph have had. They're looking for the kingdom. They don't understand the nature of what that kingdom is going to be. And we talked last week a little bit about the thief on the cross who tells, who asks of Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he has an inkling that the kingdom isn't of this life because this life for him is only going to be a few more hours. Uh, and for Jesus, even shorter, uh, because shortly after that, Jesus is going to breathe his last. And so there's this, this, uh, Joseph is described as a good man looking for the kingdom of God. We're told in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57, and also in John, and we will look at that in, in a little bit more detail in just a moment. But in Matthew 27, if I could get there. We are told in verse 57, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, so we learn that he's rich, named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. We're told in John chapter 19 that he was a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews. So he hasn't made it public. He hasn't come out and, and said, I am, I am aligning myself with this man, and uh, just because uh, Chad was mentioning it last week in class, uh, wondering how much wordplay we lose from the Aramaic uh, that was the spoken word into the Greek. Um, we have a play on words here in, in Luke chapter 23 that tells us that he was a member of the council, uh, the Greek word uh, bulutis, who did not agree with their council. Uh, the, the Greek word boule. The one word derives from the other. He does, he does, he is a member of the council who does not agree with their council that Jesus should be uh, executed for the good of the nation, as, as John tells us. But it recalls for us the division. Simeon talked about division as being a part of the life of Jesus that many would rise and fall because in Israel because of him. And we see that division here. Joseph is a member of the Sanhedrin. It is the Sanhedrin that tried Jesus before, or at least brought Jesus before the high priest in, and uh, 
gathered evidence against him that they needed to bring him before Pilate and ask for capital punishment because he was a blasphemer. And they don't use that charge against Jesus before Pilate, but they set him, they set him up as a zealot, a, a political rebel who is encouraging the people not to pay taxes and is trying to set himself up as king in place of Caesar. And it's on that basis, it's on the basis of those charges that Pilate ultimately ends up uh, acceding to their demand and having Jesus taken off and being to be crucified because he's afraid of the people. He doesn't want the people to stir up and get into a riot. And he's already in enough trouble with Tiberius that he doesn't want to go back to Rome and have to answer to yet more charges. Luke doesn't record for us the piety of Joseph, but he shows it. He shows us what Joseph does for Jesus in going to Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus. And Mark tells us in Mark chapter 15, verse 43, which I read for you, that he took courage and went to Pilate. So there's two ways of looking at this. Was it an act of courage to ask for the body of a man crucified as a pretender king, to be no, a known associate of one who was crucified for treason? Is it, is it an act of courage to go to Caesar and, or not Caesar, but to Pilate and request the body of this, this uh, political infidel, this, this rebel who uh, had been stirring the people up when at the trial it was only the Sanhedrin who, was, who were doing all the shouting and, and, and hullabalooing. Tiberius Caesar had decreed that the bodies of those who are crucified are to remain on the cross until the body falls off of its own accord, naturally, because uh, through decay. Uh, Tacitus, a Roman historian, records that for us in his annals. And scripture tells us that a body that is left out and unburied uh, to be eaten by wild animals is seen as accursed, generally, uh, generally a, a curse by God. Psalm 70 nine verse two and three that i have up there psalm 79 verse one through three. Oh god the nations have come into your inheritance they have defiled your holy temple they have laid jerusalem in ruins this is speaking about the babylonians who came in and with Neb under nebuchadnezzar and and raised Jerusalem to the ground. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. To be unburied is considered to be an act or a desecration, a, a humiliation. And it was one of the reasons that Tiberius had decreed that the, cross, the, the body is to remain on the cross is to prolong the humiliation of the one who's being crucified. It's already bad enough that he's hanging up there naked and, be, and, and suffering in great pain. Tiberius wants it to extend beyond, just to extend beyond death. And so Joseph and his request to Pilate is asking him to go against the decree that Tiberius Caesar had made, that the body is to remain up there. However, Pilate is the governor of Judea. And one of the things that Tiberius had told him was he needed to be more culturally sensitive. And that's, you know, modern uh, 21st century speak uh, spinning on what Tiberius had, had decreed to him. He had to be more sensitive to the culture and the custom of the Jewish people. For the Jews, it was an act of pious of piety to bury the dead. It was wrong for them to leave the body of one who is hanged on a tree, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 to 23. It was wrong for them to leave the, the, the corpse of one hanged on a tree, hanging there after sundown. 
the body had to come down, the body had to be buried. Uh, Josephus, in one of his writings, details how the, the burial of corpses is a pious duty for the Jewish people. Second Samuel 21, verses 12 to 14, the burial of Saul and his sons. Look in John chapter 19. Even the Sanhedrin, even the Sanhedrin don't want the bodies of the three men who've been crucified to stay there after sundown. In John chapter 19, verse 31, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so that they might, and that they might be taken away. The breaking of the legs hastens rapidly hastens the the death on the cross because you could no longer push up with your legs to take a breath um, and when they the soldiers break the legs of the two that are crucified with jesus when they come to jesus they discover that he's already dead so they don't break his legs fulfilling another prophecy in the book of psalms and they pierce his side and john records the the the, the blood and the water running out so the jews consider this a pious thing and so for Joseph to go to, the, to Pilate and say, I want the body of Jesus, it isn't so much an act of courage in the face of the decree of Caesar. Rather, I think it's an act of courage for him to come out, if you will, as a disciple of Jesus, being that he is a member of the Sanhedrin, the highly, highly respected Jewish council who wanted to present a united front against Jesus, but were unable to do so because they weren't united against Jesus. We know that uh, Joseph is the, the secret disciple for fear of the Jews, uh, and not without reason. In John chapter 7, in verse 13, uh, verse 10, but after his brothers had gone up to the peace, uh, to the feast, he also went up, not publicly, but in private. And the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. There's already a, a, um, a ban on speaking about Jesus. In John chapter nine, in John chapter nine, after the man who had been born blind was healed, in verse eighteen, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and they asked them, "Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see?" His parents answer, "We know that this is our son." and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he'll speak for himself. And then parenthetically, at least in my English Standard Bible version, it's parenthetical, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already had agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. To be put out of the synagogue, you say, oh, well, you know, they'll Fine, they kick you out of the church. You go worship at another church. That's what happens with us, right? If you get kicked out, I don't know who's kicking anybody out of the church, but if you, if you leave one congregation, you go and worship at a different one. That doesn't work if you're in the uh, first century and you're a Jew. Despite there being, I don't remember what the estimates were, a hundred and some odd synagogues within the city of Jerusalem itself, if you're put out of one, you're put out of all of them. To be put out of the synagogue means you can no longer go and worship in the synagogue, nor can you do business in any of the markets within the city because your name gets put on the blacklist and you're now shunned. You're essentially put out of the community. You are dead to them because you have turned your back on the traditions of the fathers. And so I think that Joseph's act of courage is that he steps up and he risks the respect that he 
he risks his position. He risks risks the respect that is uh, that comes with it. But, and I find this interesting. Him stepping up encourages another member of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus, to also step up and assist Joseph in the burial of Jesus. And I think that's a lesson for us that when one person takes courage, it sometimes gives other people the push they need to take courage and to step up for for Christ. Nicodemus and Joseph... Uh, I think, comprise the most unlikely burial crew for Jesus. He would expect his disciples to bury him. But if you remember the last time we saw his disciples, they were standing off in the distance behind the crowd that is, that is gathered around the cross and watching the, the proceedings here. They're still at a distance. Joseph steps up and gets right into the middle and gets dirty. He goes up and he grabs hold of the body of Jesus and somehow takes him off the cross and gently lowers him down in this linen uh, wrapping because Jesus would have been crucified naked. The Jews considered it disgraceful for anyone to be buried naked. And I mean, we still do that to this day, don't we? Somebody who's lying in a casket is clothed. You don't go to a viewing and see a, a naked person in the, in the, um, in the coffin we we treat the the body of the deceased with honor and that's what joseph and nicodemus are going to do they're going to give jesus a kingly burial uh, jesus is wrapped in a clean linen shroud he's put in a tomb where no one has been buried before uh, and if you compare that with uh, luke chapter 19 verse 30 jesus when he comes into jerusalem rides in on the colt of a donkey on which no one had yet sat. These are kingly treatments for, uh, for Jesus. If you look in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth fulfilled in the trial of Jesus. My oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the, out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people on the cross? Verse nine, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although no, he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Isaiah says his burial is with the rich. Jesus is accorded a new tomb in which no one has been laid, the tomb that is the personal uh, tomb of a wealthy man. Victims of crucifixion in Jerusalem, they don't get fancy tombs. Yes, they get buried, but they get buried in, in uh, plots of, plots of uh, ground where the, where the sinners are buried, where those who have defied God are buried. Uh, Jesus receives a kingly burial. A, a lot of respect is shown in what they're doing here. They take him down in the linen, they wrap him in the linen shroud, and then Luke gives us the, a, a time stamp. There is a need for haste. They can't take the time to fully prepare the body for burial. They don't embalm. In first, the, the first century Jews did not embalm the bodies. The Egyptians embalmed people. The Jews didn't embalm people. They instead would wrap the body with strips of linen and in inside those strips of linen they would put spices and aromatic uh, perfumes in order to cover the smell of decay because you would have this tomb the opening to the tomb is maybe three or four feet high and that's the doorway that goes into the tomb you walk you get into the tomb though and you can stand up a person could stand up and inside that tomb there would be one or more benches or shelves cut into the rock and it was on these benches that you would like you would lay a body 
And the body would lay there for a period of a year, usually a year. Uh, sometimes it was a year and a month. And after the natural process of decay had taken place, the bones would be collected. And the bones are put in a small, you know, think of shoebox, but, you know, a shoebox on steroids, a boot box. You know, if you buy a pair of cowboy boots or something, the bones would be put in this box. It's called an ossuary. And that box would be, would have a stone lid, it would be sealed, and it would be put in a slot underneath the bench that the body had laid on. And there would be room under these benches for many of these little boxes to be stacked so that the tomb could be used over and over and over again. Uh, when you read in the Old Testament uh, that a king, king so-and-so died and he was gathered to his fathers or he was gathered to his people that's the act of gathering the bones that is the gathering of the bones and putting them in the ossuary and then stacking them on top of generations of that family and that's how the jews did their burial process it was in order that the tomb could be used multiple times jesus is the first one in this tomb He's not going to be there long enough for his bones to be gathered uh, and, and stuck in a box. He, he, has, he has plans. So it's getting late. It's going to be Sabbath soon. And we're told that the women, and this is, this is, Luke really puts a lot of emphasis on the women. Because they're going to be the ones who are the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And in order to guard against the notion that well, maybe they were mistaken. They went to the wrong tomb. You know how women can be. They don't, they don't have good, good sense of direction. That's not me saying it. Okay, I already see Christy typing. <laughs> Excuse me, she says. But the word that Luke uses um, in verse uh, 55, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb, and the word is repeated, and saw how the body was laid. It, it's an intensive in Greek. It's, uh, they're paying attention. They are witness to the fact that Jesus has been buried. And they see the tomb sealed and Jesus is inside there. So we have eyewitness to the fact that Jesus was buried. No one can say that, well, he never was really buried. You know, he, he, he had fainted on the cross. And it was discovered when they went to put him in the tomb and he got up and he walked away saying, what are you doing? I'm, I'm alive. Um, it's, it, 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 it guards against the possibility that they went to the wrong tomb on, on Sunday. And it's interesting because Luke, in his mention of the Galilean women, they're the only party mentioned to be eyewitnesses to all three events that Paul calls out in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 5, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. None of the disciples, none of the, none of the, none of the 11, not 12, none of the 11 are here when Jesus is being buried. But Peter goes and, and runs to the tomb. So he knows where it is. But he was not witness to Jesus being buried there. And Luke calls out uh, that they went and they returned back to their homes and prepared spices and ointments. And then on the Sabbath, they, they have time enough to prepare the spices for um, going and, and anointing the body of Jesus on the day following the Sabbath. And then they rest. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Those who are following Jesus still follow and, and observe the commandment that Moses had given in Exodus chapter 20 and, and following uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And then Luke turns to the resurrection of Jesus, saying that on the first day of the week at early dawn, And the word there means really early dawn. This is possibly even before sunrise, but I, I would think the sun has to have, have, have risen for them to be in observance of the Sabbath commandment. They go early in the morning. Luke doesn't mention 
their worry over who's going to roll the stone away. The stone that is is in front of the tomb. Uh, does Matthew call it a great stone? I don't remember where I had read that the stone that is used. Yeah, in, in verse 60, uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 60, laid laid in his own in, in his in his in his own new tomb, which he had cut into the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. This is a stone that not one individual is going to be able to move. He's got Nicodemus with him, so we know it takes uh, it, at least two people can do it. But the, there would be a slot in the ground into which the stone would sit. And so the women are in Matthew's account or in Mark's account, in Mark's account, are wondering who's going to roll the stone away for us so that we can get in there. Um, he doesn't include, Luke doesn't include the angel who had already done so uh, for them is sitting on top of the stone when they get there. But we're told that they find the stone rolled away, but they did not find the body of Jesus. The, the same word being used there. Um, and their initial response to this is confusion. They're bringing the spices with them. Uh, the other accounts tell us that they, they're, they're coming in the morning, they're bringing the spices. So they are expecting to find the body of Jesus. Because they don't understand the scripture. And we know this from their first, their initial response to, their initial reaction to seeing the tomb empty. There's no, there's no, no body of Jesus in it. And they are perplexed. And they're standing there and they're wondering about it because they don't understand. They don't understand. Look at in, in John, John's account of the resurrection. In John chapter 20, uh, let's see, in verse 1, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away, so possibly it wasn't sunrise yet. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Their, first, their initial assumption is, Somebody came and got the body. We don't know where they went. Skip on down to verse 11. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, at one, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She still thinks he's dead. Having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Their assumption is somebody beat us to the, to the tomb and took the body away. Now, Peter, uh, we're going to be told... Uh, in verse 12, sees the linen strips lying there. And the only thing of value would be the linen strips. Nobody would take the body and leave the expensive linen cloth in which it was wrapped behind. The body is of no value. Um, that even if they're trying to uh, start the rumor that Jesus is risen, they're not going to leave the, the cloth behind. So their initial, their initial uh, response is confusion because the empty tomb is a mystery to them. They can't figure it out. How, where did Jesus go? Who took Jesus away? And the enemy of Jesus, the enemies of Jesus are going to devise a story in Matthew chapter 28 that they know is false. But you know what? They're consistent. The charges that they brought against Jesus, they knew those were false too. 
And so when they devise the story in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 11, they know it's false. And yet they perpetuate the story in order to not look so foolish and in order to discredit reports of the resurrection. Um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 11, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place, the angel, the stone being rolled away, etc. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, this is Sanhedrin again, probably Joseph and, and Nicodemus aren't there. They gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, that's Pilate, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. The women are confused. The Jews are going to, are going to uh, spread lies about it. Two men in dazzling clothing appear to the women we have in chapter 9, verse 29, at the transfiguration, Jesus, who appears in clothing that is brilliant, whiter than any launderer can make them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 10, we have two men in white clothing who appear after Jesus has ascended into heaven. Maybe the same two. Uh, the two and these two angels. And this is a, a, an unusual visitation by angels because it's not, they don't, the first words out of their mouth are not, don't be afraid. Rather, they have a rebuke. It's a gentle rebuke, but it's a rebuke nonetheless. Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's ridiculous for you to be here. Jesus isn't here. He's risen. Remember. Uh, the, um, he's not here. He's risen. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. In a uh, rebuke of the Israelites. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead? on the behalf of the living? Why on earth are you asking among the dead about the living? Why are you here seeking the dead or seeking the living when uh, among the dead? Uh, he's not here. He is risen. No one stole the body. No one moved him. He has risen. And then the angels say, remember. Only Luke uses the passion statements of Jesus, that is the predictions of his sufferings in the resurrection account. He's good. Luke, uh, Luke uses them four times here in uh, out of the mouth of the angel in verse five, uh, verse six, uh, verse seven. <laughs> the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And on the third day rise, Luke chapter uh, 18, verse 11 to 15. And then Jesus' words in Luke chapter 24 and verses 25 and 26 about how the Son of Man has to suffer and then be taken up into glory. In verse 44, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled. And then again in verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day be um, raised from the dead. Four times the words of Jesus about his coming, then when he was speaking to them in Galilee, his then coming uh, ordeal on the cross, called to mind in order to bring about a response. Remember what Jesus said. Remembering is the words of Jesus is vital for faith. Luke chapter 22, verse uh, 61, when Peter denies Christ, for the third time and the rooster crows luke's account says that the lord jesus looked at peter and peter remembered the words of jesus 
And then the light bulb went on and he said, oh. And he went outside and wept bitterly. It was at that point, there's that turning point for Peter, the conviction of his own betrayal of Jesus. Remembering the words of Jesus is vital for understanding the death and resurrection. The disciples to this point, and that was the Luke 18 quote, have been prevented from understanding what Jesus has been telling them. Uh, Luke 18, verse 31, taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them. And they did not grasp what was said. The saying was hidden from them. It's not just obtuseness on their part, but they are being kept in the dark because the cross cannot be understood before Jesus dies on it. And the purpose of God cannot be understood until Jesus is resurrected and explains to the disciples and opens their mind to scripture. And we'll be looking at that next week. Remembrance leads to belief for the women and belief leads to announcement. The angels don't tell them, go and tell the disciples. They take it of their own volition because they've put two and two together. They remembered scripture and their eyes are open and they understand though they probably are still a little fuzzy on the details and they go and they tell the group that is there as the first heralds of the gospel these women who come from galilee and uh, luke names them for us mary magdalene mentioned in chapter 8 verses 2 and 3 joanna who is the wife of one of the uh, uh, leading individuals in herod antipas's household also in a uh, verses uh, two and three of Luke chapter eight. Mary, the mother of James, mentioned also in Mark chapter 15, verse 40, possibly uh, the wife of, what's his name, Clopas, in John chapter 19, verse 25, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So it's possibly that uh, Mary, the mother of James, is also Mary, the wife of Clopas, but that's a, just a conclusion that I'm drawing. Uh, other women, including Salome from uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 40. These women are named, and I think we owe a debt of gratitude to them for, the, for their witness in the gospel because they are the first witnesses to the resurrection. They haven't seen Jesus yet, but they've heard the tale from the angels. And they've come and they've told the crowd that there's the, the 11, 11 disciples are, are here. Um, there's several others here. And th these people are going to receive their words with gladness and joy and rejoice because they know that Jesus has been written, right? No. Luke uses a medical term, uh, the, gr the Greek word leros, for the delirious talk of the very ill. If you've ever been around someone who's had a very high fever and they start muttering stuff in delirium, that's the term that he's using here. Their words, uh, the English Standard Version uh, says in verse 11, their words seem to them an idle tale. That's a fairly weak translation, but um, their words seem ridiculous, unbelievable. Some have said, some have said that the women are not believed because they are women. I'm glad Christy's not sitting in her chair. Uh, Josephus in Anti the Antiquities of the Jews writes uh, that women were to be disqualified as witnesses on account of their giddiness and impetuous nature. 
ladies, did you know that you are giddy and impetuous by nature? <laughs> uh, Origen, in his uh, in his book against Celsius, um, against Celsius rather, writes in a in book two in section uh, fifty five the mockery that Celsus had heaped on the church, saying that the Christian doctrine of the resurrection was based on the testimony of half frantic, self-deceived women. And this is written around the second century AD. So is it because they're women? I don't think so, because Paul writes, if it is, then, you know, Paul could be, um, well, some people say that Paul was anti-women. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So if it is because they're foolish women, well, God chose the foolish things to shame the wise. Rather, I don't think their testimony would have been believed if it had come from a man. I don't think their gender has anything to do with it because the resurrection surpasses human comprehension. The disciples did not understand what Jesus meant when he said that he was going to rise again on the third day. The saying was kept from them. If we had been there, we would have been just as doubtful. We would have been just as much in the dark because the purpose of God could not be known before the purpose of God is fulfilled. The disciples saw Jesus die. Their hope died with him. In verse uh, 21 of chapter 24, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Their hopes had died. They're still in deep mourning. They cannot yet understand the words of Jesus because Jesus has not revealed scripture, has not opened their minds to scripture so that they understand. They don't quite get it yet. I love the next words, though. But Peter rose and ran. Luke doesn't include the foot race that he has with John on the way to the, to the tomb and John beating him to the tomb and, and looking in. And, and we're told that John saw and believed. Peter sees the linen the burial linen and nothing else. And I mentioned that grave robbers wouldn't have left the linen strips behind because the linen was the, was the thing of value. And we're told he went home marveling at what had happened. So Peter marvels. Is it belief? Is it the beginning of belief? I don't know. Because many people had marveled at the acts of Jesus. Many people had marveled at what Jesus did and yet did not believe. Peter marvels at what he sees. And Peter, who has already remembered once the words of Jesus and how they came to pass, may be remembering some of the other words of Jesus at this point and thinking about maybe they came to pass as well. And that is where we end, at a cliffhanger. Oh, no. <laughs> because for the apostles, I think that faith, uh, one of the writers I, I read says, faith is not the inevitable result of evidence, even good evidence like the empty tomb. Faith cannot be proven, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith must be chosen and reckoned on the basis of trust. For them, faith is going to have to wait until they meet with the resurrected Jesus. Because if you remember, 10 of the disciples see Jesus. He appears to them suddenly in a locked room. One of them's not there with him. That was Thomas. We give Thomas a lot of grief for not believing the testimony of the other 10 when they say, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it till I, I, I stick my, my fingers in his wrist and, and put my hand in his side. The disciples have just heard from the women that the Lord has risen. They didn't believe either. Thomas 
doesn't believe simply on the verbal testimony of his fellows. He wants to see it. The others wanted to see it. And so Jesus appears to them. The positive side to that is that their response to witnessing Jesus raised from the dead makes their um, testimony all the stronger because of how hard it was to convince them that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They didn't just say, oh, yeah, okay, sure. Wonderful. What's next? They had to be shown. In fact, they had to be repeatedly shown uh, in verses Luke 24, uh, verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and saw, thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see. The spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And as he said, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, they still can't quite believe it. He's standing right there in front of them and they're still having trouble swallowing it. Next week, we will look at the appearances after the resurrection, the uh, road to Emmaus, which is one of the, it's exclusive to Luke, and it's one of the strongest or one of the greatest teachings, I think, within the gospel of Luke. Um, we'll look at that, and then the verses that I just read down through verse 49. The week after that will be the last uh, four verses of the gospel of Luke, and then um, we'll recap and look back at what we have what we have seen and studied thus far. Well, it'll be the entire gospel. What we have studied in the gospel, and the week after that, uh, the conversations with God uh, from Peter. Peter, do you want to share uh, any thoughts or any uh, any teaser on on where? where you're going and what you're going to be uh, sharing with us? Or is it too early? No, it's not too early in that sense. It's been something that's been rattling in my head for the last couple of years, because it's this idea of, well, what if I could get a direct answer? <laughs> I, I mean, we, we know we, we can pray, but God doesn't then tell us in response, okay, this is what I want you to do. But what we do have is the records of people who did have that. We see Moses, it's told of Moses, he spoke with God as face to face as a man does his friend. Okay, so what do I learn from how God interacted directly with Moses? And how can I then apply that moving forward? Cool. Looking forward to that. 